So I kind of want to return back to uh, some of these, these core ideas um, in biology that we talked about at the very beginning of the semester. Um, and the three core ideas in biology that we discussed at the very beginning of the semester are the central dogma. Um, another core idea in biology is that all cells come from other cells. And, um, and we talked on the first day of class how that has some pretty dramatic implications that um, every cell in your body is a molecular machine that's been operating for about three billion years, not a single break that entire time. Lots of cells have died in the last three billion years, but the ones you see now are alive because they've been alive and been dividing for three billion years. We've also talked a lot about evolution and evolutionary forces. Um, I wanted to actually, especially in these fir the first and third point, um, bring that back a little bit more and talk about that in the context of um, giraffes. Um, which was one of the first topics from this course. We talked about giraffe fighting at the beginning of the semester. Giraffes actually do actually hug themselves, hug each other with their necks too. They're not just weapons. Um, so this is not like a doctor damage. These are a couple of giraffes giving each other a nice little hug. Um, and, uh, and so um, in thinking about um, how de giraffes develop a long neck, um, one question you might ask yourself, especially in the context of development, is how does central dogma, how does transcription and translation affect this development of a long neck. Um, you also might wonder about how communication between cells, another theme, especially in the last week of the course, um, plays into the development of the long neck. Um, and then on a more evolutionary time scale, you might wonder about how sexual selection plays a role into this. Um, and also thinking about on evolutionary time scale, now a slightly different image, um, uh, um, um, how might um, a small initial population, giraffes uh, descended from, giraffes have a common ancestor with okapi, um, and the common ancestor that they have looked more like an okapi than a giraffe and didn't have the long neck. So if we had some small population of ancestral okapi that got isolated from, um, from um, a larger um, population, how might it be that that small population is more likely to have developed this, um, this sort of dramatic uh, difference in trait. Um, so for the next seven minutes or so, um, I want everybody to get back into groups one last time. Um, and uh, we'll, so we'll have about seven minutes to do that and then another seven minutes to talk about it all together. As well. What sort of regulation of transcription is going on? What Yeah, the, 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 the Hox genes that specify the neck, maybe they get overexpressed, maybe that um, by itself gives you a longer neck uh, just with a mutation in a few genes. How, what determines how, how much protein is being expressed? Yeah, transcription factor. So maybe some, maybe some transcription factor that's just upstream of the Hox genes, the one that turns on these Hox genes, maybe that one got changed. Or maybe the regulatory sequence, that's the, the promoter proximal element right before the Hox genes got a little mutated, so it, so it sticks a little bit better to our transcription factor. What that leads to? Like um, more RNA, more protein, and so the downstream things that the Hox genes are turning on that say make a neck, are more active, and so you get more of a neck, kind of, yeah. Well, not quite fully mechanistic here, but kind of giving a flavor of what might be going on. And so as the organism is developing and figuring out where to put an arm, where to put a leg, where to put a neck, where to put a head, um, how is communication between cells going on with that? Yeah, social signals. So these cells are releasing signals and saying, kind of like, hey, I'm putting an arm here. Don't go put another one right next to it. Um, okay, so what about number three, sexual selection? That was the, the group in the middle here. What did you all have to say about that? Males, yeah, they can attract mates. And then um, we also talked at the beginning of class about something else that they do, not just, not just as like a sort of feature for attraction, but um, combat. combat. Yeah, so combat. So, you know, here they are kissing, but, um, uh, and, and, um, and uh, male giraffes will hug other males and so on, but, um, but males also will, when a female is around, will fight each other with their necks. Um, and um, and the, the longer necked male wins uh, often in those fights. And so that, that sort of promotes this exaggeration of, the, of that feature. 
Um, okay, and then so our last point here, um, this small initial population, what did you all have to say back in the back about that? What were you thinking about with that? Um, yeah, so, so this idea of genetic drift. So what, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah, so more dramatic changes can happen in these small populations. So, um, so you get kind of faster evolution. And sometimes it's faster evolution that's advantageous. Sometimes disadvantageous things can happen. But um, one way or another, you can have you know, one long-necked animal, and by just random chance, that animal could pass its long neck genes on to most or all of its offspring. And then um, by random chance, those could pass them on disproportionately to their offspring. And in a small population, you can get very quickly within a few generations to the point that, in that, that all the animals in that population share are, are completely homozygous for some trait that was a very small minority trait just a couple generations ago. And so um, you can have these very rapid evolutionary events that happen driven in part by selection pressures and in part by random chance. But they can be much more dramatic and much more rapid in these small populations. <laughs>